welcome back to the lecture series on narrative mode and fiction. We are discussing genealogy, a study of genres. So, uh, talking about the impurity of genres in practice, uh, we have to understand that generic distinctions uh, are superficial, although the classical and the neoclassical periods were both obsessed with um, uh, generic fixity or compartmentalization of genres in practice. Uh, we see that uh, uh, in reality, when we start uh, either writing a work or reading a work, we see uh, a mixture, an impurity that informs uh, such a work. So, uh, generic distinctions are uh, necessarily superficial. Epic, which is a part of the narrative mode, can contain lyrical passages. And here uh, we are reminded of an example uh, very close to home, the, the example of Valmiki's Ramayana which is uh, a contentious case uh, we, and, and it is a classic case of uh, uh, generic impurity or genres getting mixed. So, for example, uh, the myth that we know is uh, that Valmiki conceived Ramayana after seeing a pair of uh, birds in an amorous stage, in an amorous act and um, a hunter killing one in the pair. Uh, and this uh, sorrowful sight, uh, sight of uh, death of one of the birds in the act of uh, amor, uh, in the act of love caused an emotion of shock or grief inside Valmiki. And this shok uh, or soka uh, reverberated in the form of sloka or verse. So, what he feels as soka or shoka uh, is uh, reflected, is, is uh, echoed in the form of a verse also called sloka. So, Ramayan is uh, as we know a Supta Padabadhya uh, versification. So, it has its own uh, uh, style of versification. Uh, it, uh, it has its own rhymes, uh, rhythms, uh, canto. Uh, and however, the source of this Karuna Rasa uh, that propels uh, Valmi Valmiki's uh, Soka. So, the source of Karuna Rasa that propels uh, Valmiki's Soka is in the external physical nature and not within him. Uh, something happening outside in the external nature provokes uh, the Soka, the Karuna Rasa in him. And so, uh, I mean, this is not a lyric. Ramana is not a lyric, but a narrative. The lyrical uh, work is provoked by intrigue, by emotions within and not without. So, if we think of genreic uh, purity, it does not hold, does not stand uh, its uh, ground uh, in the case of uh, Ramayana. Uh, in the same way, we see that lyrical poems can also contain narrative parts. So, it is very difficult to uh, distinguish. Uh, lyric and narrative uh, uh, and uh, dramatic uh, forever, right. In practice, it is not possible to exclude from a piece of uh, art or artwork everything that is foreign to it, foreign to the genre to which it belongs and uh, also to include everything intrinsic to the genre where it belongs as each work of art cannot convoke all the conditions uh, that are prescribed to it, genres are liable to get mixed, to flow into each other. And so, there is no such thing as an unambiguous uh, atomic model of genealogy or study or genres. So, for example, in the Middle Ages, a drama was meant for recitation in emulation of Seneca's uh, attitude towards his own closet drama. Uh, 
so uh, here we are talking about the Senecan tragedy, which is a body of nine closet dramas written by uh, Seneca, uh, a first century Roman Stoic philosopher in uh, blank verse, right? Now, now these were not meant for enactment, but mainly for recitation. So, the line between uh, drama and uh, lyric once again uh, is very blurred here. Uh, while ancient drama contained lyrical passages, ancient literary theory distinguished between uh, lyrical poetry, uh, which expresses uh, personal emotions and feelings uh, and are typical in the first person, and elegic poetry, which laments the death of a public uh, figure such as a king or even that of a loved one. So, when a genre changes, its label may drop out of use, but be retained for the old state of the genre or the label may be forgotten along with its content too. So, labels may also confuse because of changes within a genre. So, genre has uh, all these cases of contamination, uh, contamination being a historical situation where two genres are conflated by similarly pronounced or similarly spelled terms. Let us take an example. The root of uh, Roman verse satire could be assumed to lie in the Greek satire play, uh, which the Greeks uh, themselves did not regard as a separate genre in its own right. Satyrs were half human, half goat characters that appeared between the acts of tragedies uh, in order to make fun of the plight of the different characters and they added a comic relief. So, from that uh, satir, satir play, uh, uh, the, the term uh, travels takes on its own journey and goes on to become something else, Roman verse satire completely different from the original sense in which uh, satire play has been uh, used or understood. So, medieval comedy is liable to be not only uh, non-dramatic, uh, but also not funny. So, we talk about comedy in medieval period, not in the sense of comic. It shares few characters with ancient and renaissance comic forms, colloquial style, a happy outcome and the presentation of an uh, image of vitae are uh, some of the features we are looking at. On the other hand, the use of the same term comedy for uh, the divine comedia and the comedy of errors. Uh, are in very different sense. In each case, the significance changes and it could cause a confusion. So, with new techniques, with new techniques, genres get further dissolved and hybridized. Through incorporating new perspectives, modern writers break out of conventions and so prominent literary works partake of different genres in different degrees. Uh, and from this new genres further evolve. So, we have to understand that certain genres churn out of specific social and uh, natural conditions and ethos uh, which cannot be uh, replicated uh, onto another time space uh, and so they cannot, they, there is no universality of these genres. Think of uh, two such cases. One is Mahakavya, the other is haiku poetry. So, haiku is a 9th century Japanese poem that is typically, uh, that typically comprises three short lines without a uh, rhyming scheme. So, through the use of morals or sound unit, haiku poem uh, looks at any ordinary act, any mundane act that is happening in the natural world, but at the deeper level beyond this observation, haiku poem is also talking about existence. Uh, it is intrinsically set in the nature and the culture of Japan from which it uh, is born. 
So it is very difficult to transpose haiku to another uh, social or geographical context. Similarly, epic and Mahakavya are not one and the same. There could be some similarities, but Mahakavya is a very indigenous uh, uh, imagination or a literary form that uh, belongs to India. So, that belongs to uh, and that uh, greatly draws inspiration from the uh, ethos of uh, ancient uh, Indian uh, literary aesthetic uh, style and literary aesthetic literary aesthetic treatise that we have. So, uh, so uh, epic and Mahakavya might have uh, a lot in similar, but the Mahakavya also departs from epic in a certain sense. It is very indigenous and particular to the ancient Indian uh, aesthetics, uh, uh, literary imagination, literary essence and uh, very uh, and, and it greatly draws inspiration from uh, ancient Indian metaphysics. So, epic reflects the establishment of a particular clan or dynasty and it allegorizes history and celebrates national unity that is at the heart of any epic. An epic's purpose is to depict the picture of the communal life from a past time and to construe a sense of nation through it. So, on the other hand, uh, Mahakavya is formed when the author is able to transcend his personal conditions, become a communal entity and, and uh, the author is uh, transcending not only personal conditions, this, but also you know individual thoughts, individuation in terms of thoughts and interests and thereby entering universality, entering universality by acting in harmony with the goals of a larger community, communal well-being. Bhamaha, who is a 7th century Sanskrit poet, describes Mahakavya as a narrative uh, that essentially should have all the rasas and that is where Mahakavya is very specific like I said to the Indian aesthetics, Indian metaphysics. So, Mahakavya is a narrative that has all the rasas or sentiments present in an artwork, Shingar, Hasya, Karuna, Rodra, Veer, Bhayanak, Vibhatsya, Adbhut and the corresponding bhavas or emotions that are uh, invoked in the enjoyer of this art. These different bhavas are Rati, Hasa, Soka, Krodha, Utsaha, Bhaya, Jugupsa and Vishwaya. Further, in order for a work to be recognized as Mahakavya, it is important for it to be Sargabadha or divided into different paragraphs. And Mahakavya therefore bears the aesthetic theory of the Sanskrit classical tradition and cannot be essentially transposed uh, to another society or to another civilization. So, coming back to the question of generic purity and hybridity of genres in practice, the overlapping and immutability of uh, genres means that an imprecise terminology is more efficient. Um, thus, what Bacon calls as essay for example may not have been perceived as a generic term by Montaigne, uh, but uh, simply as an appropriate title. So, what one calls as a genre, the other could call as a title. Uh, the nomenclature cannot be universalized, right? The, the process of uh, uh, cataloging, classifying uh, is not uh, universal general for all the uh, different critics. So, changes in genre with the passage of time engender confusion of certain terms. For example, the term epigram has been continuously used since the 16th century 
so that it is not very obvious uh, how far it has changed in meaning and application or how far the kind itself has altered. So, Tudor epigram is not to be equated either as a label or as a form with uh, the modern epigram. So, terminological discontinuity in its extreme sense could lead to an entire genre system break up or temporarily go out of use. Um, so, the modernist movement uh, which committed to a myth of breaking the forms uh, avoided genre labels altogether for a time uh, or else it would invent playful new ones, right. Medieval writers felt a supreme uh, indifference towards the traditional genres. Even um, they got on well without any genre theory at all. Their associations with genres are supposed to be casual and even chaotic. So, medieval genre terms are uh, thus fraught with many problems even when the author himself attaches an explicit label, even when the author himself attaches an explicit label uh, like we see in the case of Chaucer, uh, his meaning may be in doubt. So, for example, in Canterbury Tales, the statements by the host or the narrator that offer potentially valuable generic signposts eventually give rise to very divergent, very ambivalent views. Further, even the contrast between comedy and tragedy may have a purely stylistic significance. Even the contrast between uh, comedy and tragedy may have a purely stylistic uh, import or significance. Dante distinguishes uh, tragedy, comedy and elegy as uh, evidently corresponding to three different styles of height, illustrious, mediocris and humilis. Labeling has been specifically uh, prevalent in the phase of genre theory beginning with Northrop Fry. So, labeling has been uh, specially prevalent in the phase of a uh, in the phase of genre theory beginning with uh, Northrop Fry, uh, who, resusc who resuscitated or invented uh, different terms such as Alison, Danoia, Aaron, and Anatomy, and uh, the process of uh, labeling continues with the subsequent structuralists. So, there are two important additions to genre terminology. First, the fact that names may be needed for developing kinds and subgenres, and the second is that the literary model itself may change, in which case uh, elements uh, come to have a different uh, values. So, the second is the literary model, uh, the second is the fact that the literary model itself may change, in which case elements come to have a different value and function in generic repertoires. Uh, in new ways. So, the main concept of uh, generic development has uh, rested on a distinction between degrees of literariness as far as uh, the structuralists are concerned. Two stages of art have been analyzed variously um, called primitive and artificial, simple and sophisticated, naive and sentimental, primary and secondary, right. So, the idea of primary and secondary kinds seems uh, first to have arisen in connection with epic. The older critics uh, divided epic into primitive and artificial which is uh, according to C. S. Lewis not a, a satisfactory uh, division or satisfactory distinction. Uh, Lewis would Lewis would prefer a distinction in terms of primary epic that we see uh, written by Homer or Beowulf and the secondary epic written by Virgil, Milton. Primary epic in essence is heroic, fistal, oral, formulaic, public in delivery and historical in subject whereas secondary epic is more civilized, literary private, stylistically elevated and sublime. 
So, within the secondary epic itself, there are wide disparities. A world of difference separates the form of epic written by Virgil and by Milton uh, or the 18th century art ballad such as Tickles, Colin and Lucy and the modified symbolic form of the ancient mariner. So, tertiary development seems often to interiorize the earlier kind or the primary epic. In Northrop Frye's conception of romantic mythological epics, the myths represent psychological or subjective states of mind. It is also characteristic of the tertiary phase that it should be informed by interpretation of generic features. The secondary kind may aesthetically re uh, the secondary kind may aesthetically reinterpret the primary kind. But the tertiary takes individual conventions as a material for symbolic developments that presuppose allegorical, psychological or other interpretations of them. A few generic transformations that suggest their diachronic character and their role in literary historical studies or literary history includes uh, the transformation of romance by the heroic mode to produce the heroic romance or romantic epic examples would be Orlando Furioso or the Fairy Queen. Then the development of the Picaresque as a counter genre to escapist uh, chivalric romance, Henry Fielding's assembly of the repertoire of the panoramic novel uh, Tom Jones for example from a comic transformation of prose romance together with Picaresque, heroic, romantic epic and other elements. Scott's assembly of the repertoire of the historical novel, here we are thinking of Waverly through romantic and historical transformation of the regional novel. And then the transformation of the period novel by modal extension from the existentialist novel of ideas as in the case of Jean Fowles's The French Lieutenant's Woman. So, transformations of genres can be identified with a range of processes such as topical invention, combination, aggregation, change of scale, change of function, counter statement, inclusion, selection and generic mixture. Topical inventions such as uh, student life was a well established uh, minor topic of the novel long before the university novel uh, subgenre uh, emerges. Such topical innovations seem to characterize perhaps this is because they involve a turning from interest in form to interest in matter. Combination of repertoires plays a significant role in most new forms. Uh, this becomes most obvious at the assembly stage. So, for example, the Elizabethan mask combines mummery, masquerade, pageant with entertainment. Another different additive process is uh, aggregation, which leads to several complete uh, short works being grouped in an ordered collection such as the songs in a song cycle or the ballads in a ballad opera. The Elizabethan sonnet sequence has a complex repertoire of its own which includes uh, features uh, such as liminal conventions, narrative patterns, uh, literary critical digressions, mood changes and uh, numerological structures. Change of scale was a means of generic uh, originality, something that ancient theorists partly recognized when they were attempting to describe it. On the other hand, uh, change of function holds on. So, on the other hand, certain new genres uh, or anti genres act as antithesis to existing genres. Their repertoires are in contrast throughout. In, uh, Smaller genres, in, in smaller genres, this contrast may take the form of rhetorical inversion, uh, whereby uh, dispraise is modeled, for example, on inverted praise, malediction uh, on valediction, and so forth. 
formation of new genre happens through inclusion. It could be inclusion taking place when one literary work may enclose another within it. If the inset form becomes conventionally linked with the matrix, a generic transformation has taken place. So, inclusion is found in all literary periods in a wide variety of genres. Eclogues uh, early included inset songs or narratives and they were themselves inset in the romances of uh, Sanazaro and Sydney. In one type of an epithalamian, there is a recursive inclusion, uh, a, nu a nuptial song within a nuptial song. So, Antonio uh, Minturner emerges as a chief proponent of mixture. His enthusiasm for uh, mixture shapes entire Lat Poetica. And Lat Poetica regularly discusses both pure and mixed uh, versions of kinds. So, for example, uh, pure satire is followed by comic and tragic satire. Minturno is sometimes vague about uh, uh, what constitutes this mixture, right? So, Wordsworth's approach to genre is freshly analytic, although when he treats mixture, it is with a view of uh, classifying. He lists four modes or molds or classes and then he adds to quote Wordsworth out of the three last here he is talking about idyllium, didactic and philosophical satire has been constructed as a composite order. Northrop Fry treats, uh, Northrop Fry treats uh, fiction as bound together by four chief standards novel, confession, anatomy and romance. And a mixture is simply a matter of combining these four regardless of the external structure. So, in Fry's words, the six possible combinations of these forms all exist. The most obvious sort of generic mixture is the outright hybrid, where two or more complete repertoires are present in such proportions that no one of them can dominate the text. Sonnet and uh, epigram often give uh, rise to bicorporate forms during the Renaissance. So, in comparing the sonnet with neighboring genres such as epigram, canzon and ode, critics such as uh, Robertello, Lorenzo de Medici, Pigna, Tasso, Dubele and Sibylle stressed the resemblances between sonnet and epigram in terms of brevity, point, amorous topics, uh, metrical pattern. In English, both uh, Sydney's and Shakespeare's sequences achieve some of their most individual effects through hybridity. Astrophil and Stella has several sonnets. Hybrid genre involves a uh, playing of two generic styles against one another. Sometimes this playing could happen in concert, sometimes in opposition. So, sonnet epigram hybrids were formed broadly speaking in two ways. Epigram topics and style uh, could be introduced in sonnet form or the structure could be divided externally between the two genres, sonnet and epigram. So, English tragic comedy is uh, another form of great interest uh, which remains under discussed. So, Eric Orbach uh, interprets uh, tragic comedy as the uh, happy result of backwardness. By backwardness here he is referring to the influence of antiquity that had not misled Elizabethan dramatists into a false separation of the styles. Cyrus Hoy stated that uh, irony provides strategic common ground between tragedy and comedy. Hoy uh, prefers a satiric tragic comedy and regards the earlier phase as superior. Incongruity between professions and behavior was uh, extreme both in tragedy and in satiric comedy. Comedy could uh, throw the tragic action into high albeit grotesque relief by providing a burlesque commentary. So, generic mixtures need not be full-blown hybrids. 
In fact, it is more usual for one of the genres to be only a modal abstraction, uh, a modal abstraction. So, so, it is more usual for one of the genres to be only a modal abstraction with a token repertoire, with a token repertoire. Allegory had a remarkable vogue in late antiquity and in the middle ages. Northrop Fry distinguishes a continuous and intermittent uh, allegory, uh, but uh, comes to the conclusion that to quote him, allegory is thus not the name of a form or a genre, but of a structural principle in fiction, unquote. Allegory's extension to a wide variety of kinds was uh, common during the Middle Ages and has understandably given rise to its description as a dominant form. Epigrammatic mixture uh, is in connection with structural inclusion and hybrids. The, the diastole of uh, epigram can be discerned in Herix Hesperides, this greatest of English epigram sequences accommodates features of uh, an astonishing variety of genres. I would like to stop the lecture at this point and I will meet you with another round of discussions and in another lecture. Thank you.